Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining and participating this evening. You are here at our Ask Me Anything series with our two wonderful guests, uh, Marcella McCollum and Laura Parazzi, which I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, for those of you in the room, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping things. Um, <clears throat> this is an informal session. Um, this is just an opportunity for you to get to know uh, two of our faculty um, in our Lurie College um, of Education program. Um, one of our uh, faculty is from uh, Communicative Disorders, and we have another faculty person here from Laura Parazzi. I'm sorry, from Chad, uh, Laura Parazzi. Um, but essentially how this will go is I'm gonna have um, each of the faculty um, just share a little bit about themselves this evening. Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, who they are and then um, we'll open it up to questions. So for those of you in the room, if you would like to um, ask questions to the panel, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, you're welcome to unmute, show your camera. If you're, if you're not comfortable with that, that's okay. Um, I'm going to be monitoring the chat, um, but I'll go ahead and I'll introduce myself first and then we'll go ahead and I'll introduce um, each of the faculty advisors. So my name is Francesca Teixeira and I am an advisor in, like, in Lurie College. Um, my particular role is I am a graduation and retention specialist in the college. Uh, so my role is to mainly support our students with making sure that they are being supported and that they are making um, timely progress to graduation. So many of you um, may end up seeing me at some point um, during your um, academic career. Um, but in addition to um, seeing advisors here in Lurie College, you actually also have access to faculty advisors, which Marcella and Laura also support in. So I'm gonna um, go ahead and I'm gonna introduce, first I'll introduce Marcella. Uh, Marcella McCollum. Uh, she is a faculty person um, in the, <clears throat> excuse me, Communicative Disorders Program. And I'll let Marcella go ahead and take it away and she can tell you a little bit about herself. So Marcella. Great, thanks Francesca. So yes, I am a speech language pathologist and I am a lecturer uh, within the com uh, Communicative Disorders and Sciences Department. I'm also a doctoral candidate in our EDD program, so I'm a student as well. My areas of interest are access um, to student population, so elementary all the way up to graduate school. And so that's the research that I do. I have taught um, many, almost all of the undergraduate courses in our department and a handful of the graduate courses in our department. Great, thank you, Marcella. And now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our other faculty person. Um, this person is from our CHAD, Child and Adolescent Development Department, Laura Parazzi. Laura, feel free to go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone. Okay, hi guys. Uh, so I am from the CHAD department, as Francesca said. I um, teach and I'm also one of the major advisors. I went to San Jose State for um, my master's for graduate school um, in the CHAD program. Um, and I've been teaching here ever since my classes. Um, right now I have a, a health class. I'm really interested in children's health. I also am teaching um, the lifespan development class. So my undergrad degree was in human development. So I get to use that in lifespan. Um, and then I've also taught some of the upper division GE um, courses that the SJSU studies classes that we have. Great, thank you, Laura. So, so essentially this is as titled an Ask Me Anything panel. So we have both Marcella and Laura here who um, graciously offered their time this evening um, to um, offer you an opportunity to ask any questions to them. Um, I have some questions um, if it's a little slow for the room to ask questions, but essentially um, I would like our students if they have questions for the panelists, um, I'd like to open that up for them. So um, if you would like to ask our panelists um, a question, feel free to go ahead and unmute um, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask, or you're welcome to utilize our chat feature. 
um, our chat feature for those um, that's at the bottom. Um, and I am monitoring our chat. So feel free if you'd like to ask any questions, um, you may do so now. Um, but one of the things um, I would just kind of like to get started just um, to kind of break the ice a little bit for, for both of you um, is uh, what are your, you know, what's, what's your favorite part of teaching, especially, you know, teaching at San Jose State? So I uh, came to teaching because I was supervising outside of the university. I was um, mentoring students who had just graduated and were getting their um, their licensure. And, uh, and I came back to have a conversation about somebody who had just graduated with our department chair. And the department chair said, I think you'd be a great supervisor. I think you should come back and um, and supervise for us. And so I hadn't, I had not intended to come back uh, to the university. I also got my master's degree at San Jose State uh, in this department. But I, uh, I came back and I was so excited to work with students who were just starting to learn these skills. And so, and I still find that 10 years later, I'm still really excited when I talk about a concept in class and, and I hear like a little like, oh, from the students or students have a discussion or when they push me and ask me a question that I've never been asked before. So I really appreciate the uh, relationship between the students and myself. And it's the thing that gives me energy. So this year has been a little different with COVID and online teaching, but when I would come into campus, I could teach all day long. I could teach from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. and I would get out at 7 p.m. and just be so inspired and so excited and still just like, bouncing from the energy that I got from students. So I think that's still my favorite thing about teaching. I uh, similarly um, didn't really intend to do this. Um, I was actually very similar to many of our students. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and I tried a lot of different things. I taught in a preschool and quickly realized I did not want to spend all day with four-year-olds and five-year-olds. Um, and then I, were, I did some one-on-one -on -one work um, with children and I liked that, but I still like didn't really feel like I had found it. I worked in the mental health field with teenagers and I kind of felt like I was getting closer. I was like, okay, I like this age range. Um, and then after, that's when I went back to graduate school and I thought maybe that will help me kind of figure out where I belong in this. Um, and so after graduate school, I was offered the job to teach and you know, I kind of said, well, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. And they said, well, everyone has to start somewhere. And it was just a really encouraging environment. Um, and so my favorite part of it, well, so I started with one class and it just built up over the years. Um, my favorite part of, about teaching and especially about teaching at San Jose State is supporting the students. So I was a first gen student. I went to UC Davis and you know, you're in classrooms with 500 people. There's no support. It's so easy to fall through the cracks. And then when I started graduate school at San Jose State, it was a completely different environment and I loved it. You got to know your classmates, you got to know your teachers. Um, and so I try to keep that going, really the support for the students. That's my favorite part of teaching here is helping them, giving them the guidance that I didn't get um, as a first gen student. And, um, and you know, I'm really passionate about the topic as well. So same thing, I'm just so happy on the days that I work. It just, I love, I think I get too excited maybe sometimes about some of the topics and the students aren't quite there with me, but, um, but I really, you know, it's, it's content that I love and it's an age range that I found that I finally enjoy really, really being with and supporting. Thank you. Thank you, Marcella. Thank you, Laura. I think your, your passions definitely come through, you know, even though we're not, physically in person, you know, your, your, your energy very much comes through the screen. Um, and I'm very sure that your students get to see that um, every day. So, so thank you so much. Um, also, uh, just to, again, to reiterate, if um, for those who are in the room currently, uh, this is an opportunity for you to ask questions um, to your faculty. I have some questions obviously prepared for them, um, but this is an opportunity if you wanted to get to know them um, on a personal level, I feel, um, feel free to unmute yourself or um, put questions in the chat. Um, 
if you um, would like to ask them any personal questions. Um, hi. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is, yes, Noelia. Noelia Medina. Um, I just wanted to thank you for creating this Zoom meeting because um, like you had mentioned, I am also a first generation student. So um, this is also new to me and um, I was admitted to the Communicative Disorders and Sciences program. So there's so much that I want to know and there's so little that I know as of right now. So um, my actually the reason why I went ahead and um, want to wanted to join the communicative disorders and sciences program is because my little brother has um, speech um, delay. So he has worked with a speech um, therapist for quite some time now. So um, when I was in college, I kind of was like, what do I want to do? Where do I want to go? At Gavilan College, I was in, in the uh, psychology um, that was my major. But once I talked to my counselor and I told her, you know what, I think I want to kind of do what um, the type of work that my brother has been receiving, which is um, speech therapy. And she said, you know what, San Jose State has the communicative disorders and sciences program. And I was like, oh, perfect. That works out perfectly. So I'm so happy to be here. Um, but I do have a couple questions. Um, what can I expect from the classes? Um, what kind of classes will I be taking um, in the fall? Um, just kind of little things like that, that I'm still a little unsure of and was wondering if, um, if you happen to have the answer to that. Thank you, Noelia. That's very, very beautiful. We very much welcome you to San Jose State and we look forward to serving you in the fall. And I see a little kid in the background. Is that your, bro is that your brother? Yeah, this is my little brother. He wanted to join. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Marcella, go ahead. Absolutely. So I am um, putting our roadmap in the chat box for you. And uh, all of our information can be found on sjsu.edu slash cdns. But broadly, some of the things to think about as you head into the fall semester is that our junior year, so for our transfer students, is primarily cohort based. So what ends up happening is uh, in a, about three weeks from now, so about mid-May, we uh, have our solid numbers of students that are coming into the, the major and we pair you into a cohort. And so you will be with the same students for four out of your five classes this fall. And we do that on purpose because it is, it's a, it's a whole new world coming into these courses. You'll take a course in uh, intro to hearing science. So basically anatomy and physiology of the speech and of the hearing mechanism. You'll take a class on language development. You'll take kind of a survey course where it talks about all the different things that speech language pathologists do. And you'll take a phonetics course. And I like, I like, and when I, when I teach that course, uh, I tell my students, it's kind of like learning another language. So these are four courses that are uh, pretty content heavy. And so what we found is that if we create a cohort and you're taking all four courses with the same people, you can form your study groups. You can form connections and build relationships. And so we do that for the fall. So four out of your five courses are going to be within our department and, uh, and they're kind of preset for you. And in the spring, it's five courses. So all five courses that you'll take in the spring are CDNS courses. And what's exciting about the spring is all of those initial things you learned in the fall, you start to apply them in the spring. So you get to do a guided observation course. That's a course that I designed, I love it. It's so much fun. We get to watch therapy together and we get to analyze and start to develop our clinical reasoning skills. And then in your other courses, you're talking about all those different aspects of therapy. In audiology, you're talking a little bit about hearing testing and what that looks like. And so, uh, so these courses are really nice in that they kind of blend into each other. Now, with between the fall and the spring semester, we shake up the cohorts a little bit. We want you to get to know other people. So you'll enter that spring semester with a new cohort that'll be a mixture of some of the people that you had in the fall and then some new students as well so that you can meet as many students as possible. 
And then in your senior year, we have fewer courses uh, and it, allow, it, it allows you to explore the possibility of a minor. It allows you to kind of do some other things while you're finishing up your program with us. So we uh, provide clinical opportunities. So you get to actually work with a client in a speech clinic. And in our audiology clinic, you get to do some hearing screenings. So historically, we have gone to preschools and senior centers. And that helps, I think, kind of Laura's comment about trying to figure out who it is that you want to work with. Because the beauty of the field is we work from birth to end of life. And we work from the diaphragm to the top of the brain. So there's, or from the top of the head. So there's all these different paths that you can take within the field. And this gives you a little bit of a taste into that. Oh, wow. I actually, I'm, I'm excited because not that I wasn't excited before, but I'm even more excited now because I had no idea that um, for whatever reason, I, I think because I experienced it with my little brother, I always thought that speech therapy was only for kids. Um, but it's amazing to know that it you know, it goes all the way up and I'm really excited for that and to see what um, this field has in store. And like you said, I don't know exactly what I want to do just yet. I just know that I really, really want to be in this field and I want to help. So I'm really, really excited. That's fantastic. Well, well, Noelia, I think you're in the right place because we're all we're all passionate. We all want to help students succeed. So I think you're in the right place. I want to give Laura an opportunity to to share a little bit about the Chad major. Um, so Laura, if it's okay, um, similar Hi. to Michelle, if you can share a little bit about the the courses um, the Chad students take. It's a little bit different than the CDNS, but wanted to give um, you an opportunity to talk a little bit about what that major is like. I, oh, okay. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I have a question. With, um, oh, and yes. Mine is with Chad. So, <laughs> but but since she's going to give, um, the, I'm pretty much um, the same bubble as um, the, uh, ne, Neoli had said. Um, I I want to, my major is Chad, but I still kind of like don't really know much about the field yet. All I know is the community base and <laughs> I don't know much. So I would like you to, um, I'll be very grateful to hear more about it and then see what. Sure, so we have a few different pathways in the Chad major. Um, we have the prep for teaching pathway um, where you will take courses, a bunch of Chad courses, but also in other areas, we have some English, um, some social sciences, some math courses to take, um, environmental studies that will help you prepare to take the exams for the credential program. There's two exams you need to take to get into the credential program. Um, so the path, the teacher prep path will get you prepared to enter a credential program. Um, and then we have the early childhood path, which focuses more on early childhood. And so your classes will be about infants and toddlers and um, you know we do social emotional cognitive development and that one ends with a practicum on the uh, at the on-campus um, preschool or toddler lab so you finish your senior year working in the lab with the kids um, and then we have the final plan which is our community focus plan and so usually I recommend this one to students who don't want to get their credential, teaching credential, aren't interested in early childhood, but still want to work in some capacity with children and adolescents. Maybe they're not sure where. Uh, maybe they're planning on going into some type of master's program, um, OT or so social work, something like that. Um, but it's more for working with um, families and youth out in different types of settings. And so with that plan, um, with all of the plans, you're taking kind of our core chat classes to start um, and then you kind of go into those specialized courses focused on either just children or families um, and for that that path that you end your senior year with a practicum course out in the community so we have nonprofit partners and you spend a few hours per week volunteering at those nonprofits um, so those are our three our three main plans and then actually we do have another one that um, 
it's part of the teacher prep plan. It eliminates one of the exams. So we call it the CSET waiver. It eliminates the, the one of the exams. So you take certain courses to only have to take one exam to get into the credential program instead of two. Um, but for our transfers, unless you were already kind of on that plan um, at your community college, it's, it, it adds a little bit of time onto your um, time at San Jose State. Yeah, I'm pretty much in that. Um, I, I'm currently working with preschoolers and, um, and I'm like, okay, I don't think I really want to be there forever. So, so, so I'm that type that's, I think the um, community and service, I guess that's where I, I, my, I'll focus more on, so. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank, you. thank you, Marcella and Laura, for, for, for sharing a little bit about each of your respective programs. Um, I think one of the things that I, I know from as an advisor working with students um, that come up that comes up quite a bit um, is what can you do with your respective degrees? Um, so if you can, I would love for you both to share, you know, what uh, career options or opportunities um, can students have with your respective degrees? Sure. Um, so I know the Student Success Center has um, great alumni panels where um, former students come back and actually talk about what they're doing with their degrees. So I think that's great for some ideas. Um, our teacher prep plan, obviously, they go on to the credential program to receive their multi-subject credential, um, the students in that plan. The students in the um, early childhood plan qualify for their child development permit um, and um, can uh, move up you know, with the master's degree to a program director as well. And then um, with the community focus plan, um, our students oftentimes will go on to grad school either in child development or in some other field. Um, and the, you know, that one I think is the broadest. There's a number of different jobs working with children and families that you can do with, with that particular pathway. And I have a question, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. So please with the, um, the, um, so my, my, um, I, my plan is to become a counselor eventually. <laughs> so, so, um, with the, um, this in, in my, in, in the child, where do I fit in or after graduating, uh, getting my undergrad, how do I proceed on to get into, um, counseling, which is, um, oh. mostly I think community, like, be a counselor in community college, stuff like that, work with more at, uh, older um, youth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have the graduate program in counselor ed, um, which a lot of our students actually apply for after they finish that community focused degree. Um, the community focused degree also um, allows time for a minor for a lot of students. Um, you'll need a few extra units. And so a minor in something like psych uh, might be something you know, to consider. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then afterwards, applying to the graduate program in counselor ed can definitely get you ready for a job as a counselor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, <laughs> I'm so sorry. So with um, a minor in uh, the psych, um, so please, when is it, when do I get to, um, do I have to apply for it now or I have to wait until I'm, um, in the program before I can do that. I don't know if I have to do that separately, apply for that separately now, or have to wait till I'm in, in the program before. Um, so I, I think you can wait. We, you know, we can definitely meet once you are um, a student. We meet, we'll go over your plan. We'll see, you know, where you need elective units and if that minor would be a good match for you. And then if it is a good match, I'll help you. Or, you know, um, the, uh, we have one more major advisor in our department, Dr. O'Donnell Johnson. Um, so we can help you, you know, navigate that process of adding on the minor through the registrar's office once you're, um, once you've actually started. Um, and then same with the graduate program. If you're interested in continuing on with your education, we're here to support you in, you know, how to start the application process and gathering all the materials for that as well. Does that thank help? You. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Marcella, would you like to share some CDNS career paths? Absolutely. So Many people enter the department in the field, uh, the bachelor's program of communicative disorders and sciences with the idea 
that your plan is to be a speech language pathologist or an audiologist. And so those are the kind of standard tracks that we have. Um, so many students apply to graduate school in either speech language pathology or audiology. Uh, after their bachelor's degree. Now, some students do it immediately after they graduate. Other students take a gap year or take a period of time before they move on to graduate school. Students that take a gap year frequently will take jobs thinking about where they might want to end up in the future. So uh, students who are very interested in working in the educational field may take a job as a paraprofessional and a paraeducator in the schools. Um, they may take a job as, a, they may take a, a kind of a variety of, of types of, of roles within the educational field. We've had students be an admin at a school and it gives them a really good sense of kind of the navigating the school system before they come back. Uh, other students will take roles as uh, aides or assistants in private practice to get a better sense of the field. We'll have students who head into healthcare settings, so students who are more interested in the healthcare aspect, and they may um, take small additional trainings and end up in uh, as te uh, technicians in hospitals or working in other settings. I know we have a student who is currently an EMT, um, which totally expanded her range of healthcare knowledge prior to coming back to be a speech language pathologist. Um, other students take a look at other graduate schools. So after they've finished their program, um, or as they're going through their program, they, they look at the fact that we are a lot more science-based than a lot of people think when, we come, when you come into the program and maybe think that's not really the path that I wanted to go on. I'm not really that interested in. So for example, one, one example that I give our students is if you don't like bodily fluids, you probably don't wanna work with early intervention and you probably don't wanna work in hospitals because those two places, you've gotta be comfortable with that. So students maybe uh, have a different view, especially after they've observed speech therapy for a little while and they, they wanna do something slightly different. So very related fields uh, that our bachelor's degree is very uh, complementary for our uh, master's degree in special education. So heading into special education is a path that many of our students take. Uh, master's degree in social work is another um, strong path that students thinking about maybe the focus want they want the focus to be more on families and and supporting families a master's in public health is another common path that our students can take because they have that science background uh, they have the physics and the chemistry and the anatomy and physiology and so heading into medical fields is another space Occupational therapy, we have students who head into occupational therapy as well. Um, there are, and then that we have these other kind of slight uh, at connected avenues that aren't that same speech language pathology path. So our field has what are called speech language pathology assistants. These are people who work primarily in the schools right now, although that is expanding, and they are the ones that are providing direct services. So in some school districts, speech language pathologists do the assessments and they run the IEPs and they're responsible for the caseload and the speech language pathology assistants are sitting in the uh, speech rooms doing the speech therapy. And that takes about six to nine months after your bachelor's degree to become a speech language pathology assistant. Uh, school audiometrists are another pathway that some of our students have headed to. And that takes a little bit of um, a, just a slight additional training and certification. And you can be employed by um, the districts to conduct hearing screenings in California schools. Some of our students go on to um, college programs that serve students with uh, with autism. They can be tutors or social communication coaches. Uh, some of our students go into uh, areas of supporting our students with disabilities. So we have the Accessibility Center and those are a good path for our students who have our foundational background. And then some students go into research. So uh, Stanford has a language lab and students with a bachelor's degree in speech language pathology or communicative disorders and sciences are a really good candidate to apply for research jobs that are looking at language development because you've taken the foundational coursework and you have a good sense of what that is.
interpreting another great path if you speak another language. There's lots of different things you can do with your bachelor's degree in speech language in communicative disorders and sciences. I actually have a question. So, um, for example, my, um, like I mentioned earlier, my little brother, he receives um, speech language um, help from his school. And I really like the idea of kind of working at a school and doing the same kind of thing that his um, speech language um, pathologist does with him. So I've noticed, um, I think it was in the beginning of the year, I was with him when they were doing the assessment. So he did the assessment. And like you said, you mentioned the IEP. Um, if I wanted to go towards that same route where I would work at a school and um, um, help with um, speech language the way that his pathologist does with him. Um, so I would do the two years of the communicative disorders um, and sciences program and then from there um do i have to do anything else take extra classes or graduate school or how would that work if i wanted to lean towards that kind of um uh career that's a great question so the bachelor's degree gives you the foundation and in the state of california every state's a little bit different in the state of California, you need a license or a credential to provide speech services. To, there's there's a, like 20 different names that were called speech therapist, speech language pathologist, speech pathologist, speech teacher, any of those, right? In order to do that work, you need to have either a license or a credential. And so there are two different paths. One of the paths is graduate school. And so you would apply to our graduate school and become a speech language pathologist. And that would, we provide you with the credential and the license and the, well, we get you ready for all of those things, the credential, the license and national certification. And with that, you are able to do everything that speech language pathologists can do. So the assessment, running the IEP, all of those things that you got to see. The second path is slightly shorter and that's the speech language pathology assistant. And so there are some limitations to what you can do as a speech language pathology assistant, but the majority of what a speech language pathology assistant does is um, participates in the IEP meeting. So you're there, so you can kind of hear everything, but uh, you are implementing the lesson plans and the goals that the speech language pathologist set. And so you're actually in the room providing those services, but you're not able to do the assessment. You're not able to sign the documentation. All of that is under the supervision of a speech language pathologist. So both of those paths, the SLPA track, which like I said, takes about nine months or six to nine months after your bachelor's degree and the SLP, the graduate school, which is two years after the graduate, um, after your bachelor's degree, both of those paths do have interaction, the speech interaction. The difference is kind of who gets to kind of set the course, who gets to set that path. And so that's where it does require the graduate degree because there's just, you need to know the content on just a deeper level and you need to learn about diagnostics and there, there's just a little bit more to it. And that's what the um, master's degree uh, provides. Okay, so if I were to, um, so do my two years um, uh, this starting this fall and then from there, another two years for the master's program is if, is that the way that it works oh okay okay interesting thank you thank you I wasn't sure how it worked out but um thank you for explaining that absolutely um hi my, I'm Peru again um my question is to um Laura um so Laura please I'm just curious um Chris how many classes does one need to take per semester and with the child and um, my second question is, um, if you do have evening classes and yeah, how many, how that works as well? Sure, so uh, Marcel, I'm learning so much about CDNS that I didn't know, it's very interesting. Um, so thank you. Um, okay, so for Chad, uh, most of our students as they transfer in, um, bring about 60 units and you need 120 to graduate. So you'll need to, to complete 60 units most likely, you know, depending on, on what you're coming in with. Um, so if as a transfer student, um, so if you're averaging about 15 units per semester, um, which would be five classes, 
um, you can in theory graduate in um, two years. Uh, but everyone is different, right? So some of our students are working and are taking fewer classes. Um, others feel comfortable taking more classes and finishing a little earlier. So it's really um, up to you and what you can handle each semester. Um, and, you know, maybe financial aid unit requirements might be um, a consideration as well. We also have winter session and summer session. Um, if you are, you know, want to take fewer classes during fall and spring and maybe use the summer and winter to catch up. Um, so it's really up to you and the plan that you're on and how many classes you're taking each semester for when you'll actually finish the program. Um, and then your other question was about um, evening courses, right? So kind of traditionally in our department, we um, have not offered evening courses. We do have classes that start as early as 7.30 in the morning, um, which actually I really like teaching because there's no traffic yet and lots of parking in the morning. Um, but then they go you know, throughout the day, usually ending by about four o'clock and then our master's students come in in the afternoons. Um, with this past year though, I anticipate that maybe we will have a bit more flexibility in some of our course offerings in terms of like in-person, online timing and things like that. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Marcella. Um, uh, Laura mentioned it, so now I'm kind of wondering. Um, for uh, Communicative Disorders and Sciences for the fall, how do the classes work out? Are those morning classes as well or evening or, or how does that work out? Yeah, ours is a similar model. And I think that a lot of the programs that have undergraduate and graduate programs operate on a similar model where the undergraduate courses tend to be for the most part during the day and the graduate courses tend to be in the evening because a lot of our graduate students are doing internships during the day. Um, that being said, I can give you an example of one course that is offered at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. And so the, depending on which cohort you're in, we do try to structure the, the week uh, for the four courses that you take with us in the fall and then the five in the spring so that you're not in, class, in our classes more than two and a half days per week. So that you can kind of, if you need to schedule work or whatever you need to do, you can kind of do that around those, those classes. But we are a relatively small department, so we don't have a lot of sections, and that limits our ability to offer a lot of diversity in terms of hours and time, um, days of the week. Okay, so um, so for example, for the fall, um, as as students, we wouldn't be there more than twice a week um, in, on campus. Is that what it? Or so, so this fall, everything is still up in the air. Uh, it's about every, I feel like every three days or so that we get a new email that says there's something a little bit different. Yeah. So um, our catalog, ordinarily by now the catalog is published and you can see what the class schedules are going to look like. It's not published yet for anybody because we're still sorting out uh, what kind of class, like what class size can we be in with our, uh, how much space in between classes are we going to have to give and is that going to change our schedule and the hours that we offer them and how we offer them. So for this fall, when you come in, we still don't know exactly what the schedule is going to look like and we don't know how much of it will be in person. I know that our goal is to make sure that as much as possible that we can be in person, we wanna be in person um, with you. But there also is likely, like Laura mentioned, to be a little more flexibility for students who can't necessarily make it yet um, in person. The, the buzzword that the university keeps using is that fall is the transition semester. Mm -hmm. We're transitioning back to the in-person campus that we're used to being. So, so all of that is to say I don't have great answers for you yet. I do know that um, our classes are structured. Each class is structured as one time a week for two hours and 45 minutes. So whatever classes you're in, in our department, they're all once a week classes. So you'll have five classes, four of them will be ours and those four will be once a week. And that's how we try to get you here for, for the fall, just two days a week so that you're only here for, for those four classes, you're here two days. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and write that down just because I want to be able to um, 
Uh, so, um, so as of right now, would you happen to know if maybe by around June, July, we will know when, how all of that's going to work out in regards to online or in person? Absolutely. Yeah. I'll be holding informational sessions for transfer students. So the college is holding sessions for you all in May. And then I'll be holding one for our cohort so that you can, once we have the exact classes and the exact days, I'll be holding an informational session talking about some of the things, the great questions you're asking right now. So I'll talk a little bit about the cohort model and then I'll actually have the schedule um, where you all can kind of see exactly when the classes are. Okay, and then um, will we receive emails or do we have to check in with you or how does that work? Um, what will, or how will we be updated on classes and scheduling and all of that? So because our department does that cohort model, we're a little different than the average department. So in most departments, you have your roadmap and you go onto the catalog and you sign up for your classes. Our department is a little different in that sense. So we actually, you will get an email from us. So if you come in as a CDNS major, our admin has your email address and you will get an email directly from her with the cohort, it'll say you're in cohort A, your class, here are your four classes, here are the times and the days, and here's the code to register. So you'll get all of that um, in an email from us. You don't have to keep checking in. <laughs> okay, and then, um, so since you mentioned that, I'm sorry, I have so many questions. Um, since you mentioned that, um, so I know that in, I believe in June, we have, um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot, totally lost a word. We have to go ahead and um, kind of, virtually visit the campus and registration. So for registration, um, will, will I be registrating along with everyone else or, or no, since you said it's a little different for us? You will get the codes from us before your registration date opens. So oh. you'll have the information. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Hi, Laura. Um, this is Haru again. Please, I'm um, just uh, after listening to um, Marcella, I'm just curious, does um, Chad also have um, the cohort um, program as well, or it's just completely different? And uh, my second question is, um, I did receive um, an, e an email from the Humanity and um, uh, Honor Program saying that uh, from San Jose State, um, saying that I was eligible for based on my GE and stuff, but I don't know. So I wanted to check in with you to see whether you are aware of your students doing or taking anything like that, doing any humanity honor program, which is um, kind of like tailoring towards your um, GEs and stuff like that, so. Um, I'm not sure about that. Francesca might know more because I think you do more of the GE advising. Um, so maybe we can come back to that. I did think of a couple of things. Yes, as Marcella was sharing that, you know, how it looks in Chad a little bit different. So in Chad, our classes are an hour and 15 minutes and they meet twice a week. Um, so either Monday, Wednesday or Tuesday, Thursday, and then you'll always have your Fridays off. Um, so you can, in theory, book all of your classes for Monday or Wednesday or a Tuesday or Thursday and come to campus two days a week. We don't have cohorts um, like CDNS. We're a much larger department, um, but we have a lot of different course offerings um, that, uh, you know, maybe makes it easier for students to find classes that fit with their schedules. But as you start to kind of go into your specialization um, in the teacher prep or the early childhood or the community focus, you do end up with the same students a lot of time because you're all taking the same courses and pretty much in the same order. Um, so you, you will end up with students that are similar, you know, in similar classes as you are, but we don't specifically have the cohorts. Um, and then in terms of like registering for your classes, we'll definitely help you with that. You can attend the orientations um, that will start happening, I think in May and June perhaps. Um, and so we'll get you started with like your roadmaps and what classes to sign up for. Does that answer your questions? Yes, it did, thank you. Sure. Yeah, so thank you so much, Marcella and Laura, for, for taking the time to, to answer those questions. And thank you to the students um, in the room. I think you asked really, really great questions. And 
I'm sure a lot of our transfer students have very similar questions. So um, I, I forgot to mention that this is being recorded um, and will be placed on the YouTube um, for viewing. So, um, but to the students who did attend um, the live session, thank you so much. I think you asked really, really great questions. And I know there's a lot of questions as from, from an advising standpoint, um, those same questions that you guys are asking were, we're getting these as advisors too. So there's a lot of uncertainty um, I know um, around the fall. Um, just to give you some context, um, right now for our students, the big thing right now is to for them to say if they're coming to San Jose State or not. So if, if you already submitted your intent to roll um, or intent to come in the fall, great. Um, as our Student Success Center, um, we'll be reaching out to you individually um, to let you know of our orientations. Um, so this is your opportunity to get some advising, let you know of the requirements at SJSU. Um, and this kind of segues a little bit into the summer orientation. Um, Noelia, you mentioned that, the virtual orientation. Um, and then you'll be receiving some information um, from your respective departments. Um, as it gets closer um, to the fall. So, um, so unfortunately, we're, we are we are at time uh, today. I want to respect our panelists' time. So, a big thank you to Marcella McCollum and Laura Parazzi for taking the time out of their very busy schedules uh, to speak um, to all of you today to share a little bit about um, each of their respective programs: the CHAD major and the CDNS major. Um, First, new students, um, like I said, you'll be hearing um, a lot more from the departments as it gets closer to the beginning of fall. Uh, but if you have any questions um, as it relates to um, your uh, admission status, or if you have any questions related to the timeline, um, I put my email in the chat. Um, I am an advisor in the Student Success Center, so if there are any specific questions, you're welcome to reach out to me, and I'm I can I'm happy to funnel questions. I'm sure Laura and Marcel would be okay if anyone has questions. Um, I can always funnel them um, directly to them. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And I wish you a very great rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Thank you all so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take Bye. care.